Okay. Uh, then uh, today we're going to uh, continue talking about parity. So let me remind you of the basic situation. Uh, we have discussed at length uh, uh, ro rotations, as to say, proper rotations. These are examples of, uh, of uh, space-time symmetries. In fact, uh, proper rotations reflect the geometry of the three-dimensional space we live in. And uh, we have studied how these uh, space-time symmetries are implemented on, on quantum mechanical systems by means of operators, in fact, unitary operators. Uh, the subject of parity brings us into the uh, area of uh, improper rotations. In fact, every proper rotation gets mapped into an improper rotation and vice versa if you multiply by the spatial inversion operation. And in fact, the parity operator, which acts on a quantum system, is the uh, quantum analog of the spatial inversion operation, which takes place at the level of geometry and three-dimensional space. This is the basic uh, overview of what we're doing. I might add that there's another space-time symmetry we'll consider uh, probably later on this hour, which is uh, time reversal. Uh, time reversal involves time. Uh, and all of these, uh, uh, proper rotations, improper rotations, time reversal, and I should add translations in there as well, uh, are examples of Lorentz transformations. And in fact, the whole subject is united in a relativistic treatment, uh, which we'll touch on at least uh, to a certain extent next semester. All right. So uh, the way that we are developing the parity operator in a quantum system is that, is that we're, uh, first of all, calling the operator pi, and we're uh, placing a set of postulates and requirements that it has to satisfy. Uh, first of all, that pi should be unitary uh, in order that it should preserve uh, probabilities. Uh, this is normally what you expect with symmetry operations. And then properties two and three are reflections of the property of the spatial inversion operation at the level of classical geometry. The first one says is that pi squared is the identity, uh, pi squared equals one. And the third one says that uh, pi commutes with all rotations, all proper rotations, that is. So if r is a proper rotation, by conjugating uh, pi with uh, such a rotation operator, you get pi, the uh, parity operator, back again. So these are our postulates. Now, to review briefly what we did last time, we're taking, uh, uh, oh, to back up slightly, uh, these are the requirements we impose on the, on the parity operator. As we'll see, the parity operator has different forms depending on the quantum mechanical system. So we'll, uh, we'll give different examples of the parity operator depending on the pet space. Uh, but these, uh, these uh, impose restrictions on what form the parity operator uh, can take. As we'll see, they don't uniquely specify the parity operator, but they narrow the possibilities rather much, so there's not too much choice left when you're done. Uh, we started by taking the case of a particle moving in three-dimensional space without spin, so the wave function of psi of r, and we decided that the proper definition of parity should map this wave function to psi of minus r. It's really a guess, but this is what we do. Or we can write this in ket language by saying that pi acts on the position eigenkets and maps them into uh, another position eigenket with the opposite position. And uh, this we take as a definition of parity. On a, on a, for a system with a, uh, a spinless particle. Uh, next, we took the case of a particle in which we, uh, which had spin, but we ignored the spatial degrees of freedom. So we'll look at just the spin part. In that case, the ket space is spanned by the basis cats, the Hilbert space is spanned by the basis cats SM, where S is the spin of the particle, and M runs from minus S to plus S. And by considering, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, property three here, which is the uh, requirement that the parity operator should commute with rotations, really comes in two versions, because if an operator commutes with rotations, we call it a scalar operator. And moreover, uh, a scalar operator has to uh, commute with all three components of angular momentum. So this is conditions 3A and 3B, which are really equivalent to one another. So by requiring, oh, going back to the system with spin, by requiring a parity commute with J sub Z is one of these equations. What we found last time is that if you let parity act on one of these basis cats, you, you get something that has to be proportional to the same basis cat with a proportional locality factor of the right as D. This is saying that the basis states of a spin system are all actually all eigenstates of parity with some eigenvalue E. Now, if you apply pi to both sides, or if you just use the fact that pi squared is equal to 1, you easily conclude that the square of this eigenvalue must equal to 1, and therefore the eigenvalue itself must be plus or minus 1. 
if all you do is look at the Jz equation, uh, you, you wouldn't know whether or not this eigenvalue might depend on which of these vectors you're using. As to say, it might depend on the other. However, uh, we'll recall that a scalar operator has eigenvalues that are independent of the magnetic quantum numbers. It applies normally to the logic we use in Hamiltonians, but it applies for parity as well. Or if you'd like, you can apply raising and lowering operators to both sides and show that the eigenvalue is actually independent of the magnetic quantum number. And thus, the eigenvalue, which is plus or minus 1 in this equation, this eigenvalue, is the same value, that is to say, either plus 1 or minus 1, for all of the states, all of the basis states. And thus, it's the same value, in fact, for the entire spin Hilbert space. In fact, it's not really a characteristic of the state, it's, it's a characteristic of the particle. That is to say, in the same way that the spin S is just a fixed number, which is characteristic of the particle. So this plus or minus 1 that comes out this way is called the intrinsic parity of the particle. There's a question now about whether or not uh, this plus or minus 1 can be narrowed down further to decide <coughs> which of the two it is by using our postulates or using experimental data. Yes? Um, is it just by uh, definition that parity is uh, diagonal to the basis of no, it's not by definition. It comes by, uh, I, I went over this briefly last time, it comes from studying the commutation relations of pi with jz. The fact that pi commutes with jz means that if you apply jz to both sides, you find that pi acting on this is an eigenstate of jz with the same eigenvalue. But there is only one state that has that eigenvalue, that, eigen, that eigenvalue, and that's s in itself, so they have to be proportional. That's the logic. Um, um, all right, so this uh, E plus or minus 1 is characteristic of the particle that's called intrinsic parity. Now, there's a question about whether uh, further postulates, these postulates, or further postulates, or theoretical arguments, or experimental data would allow us to decide whether E is equal to plus 1 or minus 1. And the answer is, is that if you're dealing only with non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the answer is no. There's, there's no way to decide whether it's plus 1 or minus 1. The reason is that in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the number of particles is conserved. So in any, in any transformation, the number of particles of a given type is the same at the beginning as it is at the end. It's a constant function of time. And so if you decided that some particles have a positive intrinsic parity and others have negative, or if you change your mind about that, it wouldn't in any way affect the balance of parity, whether it's conserved or not, on the two sides of it, as a function of time on two sides of a reaction or something, or a scattering reaction or whatever. So it's a purely arbitrary choice uh, as long as particles are neither created nor destroyed. However, we'll see, as we'll see next semester, in relativistic quantum mechanics, it does make a difference because you can create particles. So whether you have three particles of odd parity makes a difference is different from having three particles of even parity. And if you can create one, it turns into four, and that makes a difference too. So in fact, in, in, in relativistic quantum mechanics, you find that particles have, let's, they have this intrinsic parity and it's something that uh, can be determined, uh, ex can and is, in fact, determined experimentally. Um, I, uh, I'm glossing over some things, oversimplifying things a little bit uh, in regard to fermions. We'll worry about that next semester. But let me just leave it for now by saying that uh, a, a deeper understanding of parity requires a relativistic theory. But for now, as long as we're sticking with a non relativistic theory, we might as well just take this E equals plus one here. And that's, in fact, what we'll do for the rest of the semester. So we'll just say that. Parity acts on spin states and just maps it into itself. It doesn't do anything to spin. Basic non-relativistic rule: parity doesn't do anything to spin. It does, however, affect the spatial part of the wave function, as you see here. All right. Now, uh, by the way, this rule in uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you don't uh, create or destroy particles, is not quite always true. And the reason is that photons are particles that have zero mass. And so they can be created or destroyed in arbitrary numbers in arbitrarily low energy interactions. So ordinary matter, ordinary energies, uh, under, uh, you have a creation, of, you have emission and absorption of radiation going on all the time. And so when it comes to the, the question of emitting and absorbing photons, the intrinsic parity does matter. And in fact, as we'll see, the intrinsic parity of the photon is minus one. Uh, and that means, for example, that when you, an atom emits an electron, excuse me, when an atom emits a, a, a photon, in a, let's say in an electric dipole transition, it means the parity of the atomic state changes. This is the way of, in which parity is conserved in the, uh, in the electromagnetic interactions. I'll elaborate on that a little more later. All right. Now, um, when we were doing proper rotations, we uh, went through a, a discussion of how various operators transform 
on proper rotations, and we classified operators as scalars, vectors, and so on, depending on the transformation properties. Now we can do something similar uh, in the case of parity. Uh, let's uh, go back to the case of a particle that has a spinless particle moving in three dimensions as a simple example, so the wave function is psi of r. Uh, if we consider, for example, taking the position operator and conjugating it by the parity operator, pi r pi dagger, it would be a good guess that this should turn into negative of the position operator because that's what the spatial inversion operation does to the position vector at the level of classical geometry or the geometry of three-dimensional space. In fact, this is uh, correct, and, and we can show that it's true. And with this definition of parity, we can show that it's true rather easily. Uh, first, let me uh, note that pi dagger, uh, pi here is unitary as part of our requirements, but since pi squared is equals 1 is also a requirement, this implies that pi inverse is equal to pi. And since pi is unitary, it means it's also equal to pi dagger. So pi is actually not only unitary, it's also permission, as you see. So pi dagger here is actually the same thing as pi. I can drop the dagger if I want it. Now, let's take a wave function and look at psi of r, and let's apply these, these three operations, pi multiplication by the position operator and pi in sequence, and see what we get. So the first pi turns this into psi of minus r. Then we multiply by the position operator. Maybe we'll put a hat on it to indicate that it's the operator and not the C numbers. That corresponds to just multiplying the wave function by the corresponding C numbers, as to say, without the hat. So psi of minus r goes into r times psi of minus r. And then we apply pi again, which changes the sign of all the r's, and so it goes into r minus r psi plus r now. And you can see the overall effect is to multiply the original wave function by minus r, which is what this says on this side. So this is a simple derivation of, of this conjugation relation for the position operator. Now, by a very similar analysis, you can show that if you conjugate the momentum operator, with parity, uh, and this is again speaking of a spinless particle in three dimensions, but this goes over into minus the momentum. And so the position of momentum operators are, as you see, are odd in parity. Excuse me, I realized that there was something I meant to say a minute ago, uh, but I didn't say, so let me put this question of the transformation of operators on hold and go back to what I meant to say. Uh, we dealt with a case of a particle that had no spin, and then we dealt with a case of a particle where we didn't care about the spatial degrees of freedom and we were only looking at the spin. If we combine those two together to deal with, this, with a particle where we care about both spatial degree of degrees of freedom and spin, then how should we define parity? Well, the logical definition would be to take the basis states, which are Rm like this, basis cats of the system, and just <coughs> since this is a product of a, of a spatial times a spin basis state, and we know what they, they do here, you see by these two rules, logical definition is that this should be equal to the basis cap of minus the position r, but the limit doesn't change. And if we do this, then the wave function, seen as a 2s plus one component spinner, is going to get mapped into psi of, psi of m minus r. The parity changes the spatial coordinates, but it doesn't do anything to the spin. It's a simple rule. Now, let me go back to examples of how operators transform under parity, again, dealing with a spinless particle in three dimensions. And we see that the, uh, both position and momentum operators change sign under parity. <coughs> uh, this means that if you take the orbital angular momentum operator and conjugate it by parity, since it's r cross p, you see the two signs uh, cancel, and you get plus l. So l goes into plus itself under parity. Actually, this had to be true because one of our requirements is, is that pi should commute with the angular momentum of the system, and L is the angular momentum for the system of this kind. So it's really just a special case of 3A here, which you see explicitly that it works out. So some vectors you see change sign under parity, and some don't. All of these things, R, P, and L, are vectors insofar as they transform as vectors insofar as proper rotations are concerned. But when you throw in my, uh, improper rotations, parity, they have a different transformation law. Vectors that transform with a minus sign like this are called uh, just ordinary vectors or true vectors. And those which transform with a minus sign are called pseudo vectors. Uh, and angular momentum is, the, is an outstanding example of a pseudo vector. Other examples are magnetic fields. You see, electric fields are true vectors, and magnetic fields are pseudo vectors. 
Um, the, um, this, of course, generalizes to any angular momentum J like this. Now, in addition to classifying uh, vectors, we can also classify scalars. Let's suppose K is a scalar. Uh, I'll, I'll remind you that uh, our interest in scalar operators is that Hamiltonians for isolated systems are invariant uh, under, under proper rotations because the energy can't depend on the orientation. But there's a question about uh, what happens to such Hamiltonians under parity if there's spatial inversion. Well, in any case, if we have an operator K and we conjugate it with parity, and suppose it goes into plus K, then this is what we call a true scalar. And uh, on the other hand, if we conjugate it with uh, what's called an S, another scalar, but with parity, it goes into minus itself, and it's called a pseudo scalar. Now, um, so the, the operators which are scalars, insofar as proper rotations are concerned, can be further classified as true or pseudo, depending on how they behave under parity. Notice the sign, of a true, the sign of a true scalar here, the plus sign, is the opposite of what we call a true vector. You get a minus, minus sign for vector. The, the, signs, the signs, as far as the true and pseudo, get reversed when you go from vectors to scalars. <coughs> yes. It's sort of natural that a vector should change sign and parity. It's what we call a true vector. All right. Now, uh, so, uh, Hamiltonians, of course, are the most interesting operators. Let's ask how Hamiltonians transform under parity. And in particular, uh, are they invariant under parity in the same circumstances as they are in the proper rotations? Is being isolated enough to be invariant under parity? That's a good question. Uh, well, if we take a central force Hamiltonian, for starters, as an example, p squared over 2m plus v of r, it's easy to see that this does commute with parity. And the reason this is that p squared is, of course, the dot product of the momentum vector with itself. And both of those are odd under parity, as you see there. So when you take the dot product, it goes into itself, the plus sign, and that makes it a true scalar, I guess. So you can address this later, actually, but I'm also a very good visual understanding of what means to transform something under parity. Well, um, there's really two, two phases of it. One is in the le at the level of plasma geometry, where you invert a vector through the origin. So you want to see what's happening on the other side. Um, the uh, you invert vector through the, your heart is the you know, center of the, the origin. It swaps right and left. Um, it's not an operation you can do on a rigid body without tearing all the atoms apart and moving them around. It's not like a proper rotation where you can really turn a book. You know, you can't, you can't parry it. You can't spatially invert a book without you know, making a new book and say it's written the other way around. Um, but anyway, that's what it is at the level of, of spatial geometry. Uh, I think your question was, can I clarify what this means on a quantum system? It might help in the case of the wave function here, just to see what this does to the wave function. It just, it just flips the position vector. So if I have a, a wave function like this, x, y, and z, let's say that it's concentrated here at the blob and the plus y axis, then the, 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 this is the state psi, and the state parity acting on psi is concentrated as a blob on the minus y axis. It's flipping through the origin. Like this. Okay? Does that help? Yeah. All right. Um, can you think of it like a mirror reflection? Uh, yes, a mirror reflection is not the same as parity, but it's very closely related. A mirror reflection is an example of an improper rotation. The reason the mirror reflection is not the same as parity is because it just reflects in one plane through like this, whereas parity reflects through the origin. However, if you have a, a plane like this, then the mirror reflection in the plane is the same thing as a total spatial inversion followed by an ordinary rotation by an angle pi in the plane. So what the, what the, so in other words, I can write this, if I call, let's see, let's call it M the mirror operation. This is equal to parity times the rotation perpendicular to the plane by an angle of pi. This is a proper rotation. So the product of the two is an improper rotation. Mirror, mirror inversion is a special example of a proper rotation. You can see this because First, you, you, invert, you invert through the origin. That's what pi does. And um, maybe I should call this p here to indicate that this is at the level of class, the class word or, or, or three-dimensional geometry. The p inverts all vectors through the origin, so it flips x, y, and z. Whereas if I then follow by a rotation of the plane, if this were the z-axis, 
what that would do is change the signs of x and y back again so they become pluses, but the z stays a minus, okay? So that's, it's very closely related to parity, uh, uh, mirror, mirror reflections. All right, thanks for these questions. They really help, I think. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so I was uh, I was getting to the uh, question of uh, how do real Hamiltonians transform under parity, and and and, and uh, in particular, is it true that isolated systems are invariant under parity? Well, if we have a central force Hamiltonian, it's clear that it is invariant under parity because the kinetic energy is p dot p. These are two uh, true vectors. They change sign under parity, but when you take the dot product, the signs cancel, and so p dot p is a true scalar, as you see. And similarly, the radius r is the square root of r squared, and r squared is the dot product of r dot and r, both of which are odd under parity, so that again, the square is even. And so this entire Hamiltonian is even under parity. This means that all central force Hamiltonians commute with parity. This is just for a single particle interacting by means of a scalar potential. If you generalize this to multi-particle systems that are interacting by scalar potential, um, actually, as we know, uh, as, uh, this Hamiltonian that I just wrote down here is, a, as I say, it's a single particle system, but as, as we know, they typically arise in two body interactions where we go to the center of mass frame and separate that out. And uh, the requirement is that the potential be a function only of the distance between the particles. Then you get this with the center of mass uh, or the relative motion. Now, um, if you go to a multi particle system, you will find that it's still invariant under parity as long as the potential is a function only of the distance between the particles. This is, the, this is what you have if you have only electrostatic interactions between particles. Charged particles don't just interact by stat electrostatic interactions, but it's a lot of times a good approximation. And it's used all the time as a model in, in uh, molecular condensed matter physics, for example. So all such Hamiltonians can be parity. Now, what about if we include spin and relativistic effects? One of these we've seen already is where we've got some function of r and we get a spin orbit term, L dot s. What does that do to parity? Well, L and s are pseudo vectors. They are even under parity. And so when we take the dot product, we get a scalar, which is also even under parity, and s was a true scalar. And so the L dot s terms, the spin orbit terms that occur in atomic physics still conserve parity. What happens if we add more electromagnetic effects, such as relativistic effects, uh, retardation, emission and absorption of radiation, and so on? Does it still conserve parity? Uh, the answer is yes, except that when you're talking about emission and absorption of radiation, you have to take into account the parity of the photons as well. You need to include that as part of the system. Uh, and if you do that, then you find that parity is conserved. This is part of the statement that the electromagnetic forces conserve parity. Now, what about uh, the strong interactions, which are responsible for holding the nuclei together, the interactions and strong forces between particles like the proton, the neutron, the time s on and others? Is there a question here? Oh, uh, yeah. Just using the phrase conserve parity, is that completely equivalent to having a true scalar Hamiltonian? Yes, it means that commuting with parity. Uh, you know, um, uh, what you call a conserved uh, quantity, what you call in classical mechanics, would be, would be one whose time is, is, is constant in time under the, under the Hamiltonian. And in classical mechanics, that's equivalent to saying that it's Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian is zero. There's an analogous statement in quantum mechanics that we look, for example, the Heisenberg equations of motion. The um, operator has the, the time evolution is zero if it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Or an, another point of view is its expectation values with respect to arbitrary states are constant in time if the operator commutes with the Hamiltonian. So normally you talk about it, something being constant in time or constant in motion, you mean something somebody that commutes with the Hamiltonian. And this would be the case of parity in these, these examples that I'm talking about. All right. So in particular, it would mean that the parity of an initial state would be the same as the parity of the final state. As it turns out, that in the strong interactions, parity is conserved there as well. Uh, this is a fact that is, uh, was originally established uh, on the basis of experimental data coming out in the 1930s and 1940s. And uh, that, uh, that in all observed strong interactions, the parity of the initial state was equal to that of the final state. In order to make this work, you have to include the intrinsic parities of the particles that are involved. It became evident that the pi meson has a negative parity. But once you do that, the rules work out. And so the result was is that for a long time, uh, people thought that parity was a fundamental symmetry of nature and that all isolated Hamiltonians would conserve parity. 
Well, then in the 1950s, it was uh, suggested by Li and Yang that in the case of the weak interactions, that parity might be violated. And in fact, they proposed an experiment that involved spin polarization of the decay of the like electron decay and a, 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 a beta decay, electrons and beta decay. And this experiment was quickly carried out, and it turned out that indeed parity is violated in the weak interactions. In fact, it's maximally violated. It's, it has the worst possible parity violation you could get given the matrix elements you work with. Uh, so this is a notable case in which parity is violated in isolated systems. It's in the case of the weak interactions. It's just a property of the weak interactions. Um, now, uh, under normal circumstances, the weak interactions are extremely small. I mean, they're in incredibly, amazingly small in, in ordinary low-energy, you know, electron-volt type scale, scale interactions that you find in atoms and molecules in condensed matter physics. And so the result is, is that, that in all, all, that all such systems that arise in the practical matter, low-energy non-relativistic systems of this form, you can, to, you can assume to an extremely high degree of accuracy that parity is conserved. Um, this is what one would normally do. In fact, parity violations are so small that they're extremely hard to see, even if you're looking at them, which quite a few people in this department in the last 20 years or so have been doing. Uh, uh, Gene Cummins, before he retired, and Dean Booker have both been involved in experiments involving parity violation in atomic physics. In any case, these are really hard experiments. So anyway, that's part of the story of parity violation of the weak interactions. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, weak interactions become relatively more important as the energy increases, and so at higher energies, uh, they, uh, the uh, weak interactions play a more important role. All right, uh, so that's some, uh, that's some comments about uh, weak interactions uh, uh, and places in which parity is conserved where it isn't. But even without going to the weak interactions, it's certainly easy to write down Hamiltonians that don't conserve parity. And the easiest way of doing it is if you don't make the Hamiltonian isolated, you put it in an external field. Uh, suppose, for example, I go back to my kinetic plus potential Hamiltonian, except I'll make it an old, uh, I'll make it a, I'll throw out the spin order term because I don't care about that. But let's make the potential a Q phi like this. But let's say the potential is not rotationally invariant. Maybe there's a uniform electric field in the z direction. Let's call it e to e zero z hat. So that phi, the scalar potential, is minus e zero times z. And so this becomes q phi becomes minus q times e zero times z, the direction, the, the coordinate of the z direction. And now you see if you conjugate this Hamiltonian with parity, the z change is sine. It goes from plus z into minus z. So the external electric field is broken the parity conservation. Actually, you'll find that um, external magnetic fields don't break parity conservation, but external electric fields do. Um, this means that in experiments to detect parity violation, you have to be particularly beware of, of stray electric fields if you mess up the experiment. Um, the, um, the definition of, of the, by the way, whether a system conserves parity or not depends on the definition of quote unquote the system. If we include in the system, uh, here we're just thinking the external electric field is given, but if we include in the quote unquote system the charges which are producing the field, maybe there's plus and minus charges on a capacitor plate, making a uniform electric field in between. If we include those charges in the system, then when we apply parity, the two plates reverse and the plus and minus signs change, and so the electric field changes, and that compensates for this and restores, a, 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 a restores parity uh, conservation again. So you get parity violation if you don't include the external fields as part of the system, external electric fields. All right. All right. Um, to go back to systems that can commute with parity, let me go back to the central force Hamiltonian because it's common in practice and, and uh, it's an important case. That, that we'll be dealing with a lot. Let's just go back to this. It's under force Hamiltonian. Uh, we know that there is a complete set of commuting observables here, which is the Hamiltonian L squared and LZ. And this is reflected in the energy eigenspace. We usually write as NLM like this. Uh, but now, uh, what we see is, is that there's another operator we can throw in the mix here, which is parity, which commutes only commutes with H. And as you see, it also commutes with L squared and LZ because parity commutes with angular momentum all three components and so many function of it. 
And thus, it is possible to organize the energy eigenstates of any central force Hamiltonian so that they're also eigenstates of parity. So the question is, what's involved with that? Well, the easy way to answer that is just to look at what pi does to one of these standard energy eigenstates in the central force Hamiltonian, which is this do. Well, this will be easier to analyze if you look at the wave function. The wave function is R and L of R times the Y L M is theta and phi, like this. All right. There is a property of the YLMs that I didn't mention before, but it is this. Is that if you take the YLM and you multiply it by R to the L of theta and phi, this is implicit in the development of the theory of YLMs that we developed uh, uh, several lectures ago, which is, just, which is given in the notes. It's implicit in that development that if you take a YLM and you multiply it by the radius to the L power, what you get is a homogeneous polynomial with the coordinates x, y, and z. For example, if L is 3, so you're dealing with cubic polynomials, you'll find that this is some linear combination for the case L equals 3. It'll be some linear combination of polynomials that are like x cubed, x squared, y, x, y, z, etc. Cubic, all cubic polynomials. And since when we conjugate the position vector under, under parity, the, they change, change a sign, it means that x, y, and z all change sign. And so such a polynomial is odd under parity. Likewise, if L is even, you get an even polynomial. And so the result is, is that R to the L Y L M under parity goes into minus 1 to the L times itself. On the other hand, the radial wave function depends on the radius, which is invariant under parity. And so the effect of the total wave function is simply to, of pi is simply to bring out a factor of minus 1 to the L. Parity, the, the, the energy eigenstates, the eigenstates of HL squared and LC that we normally use, as it turns out, are automatically also eigenstates of parity, and the, uh, and the eigenvalue is minus 1 to the L. This is a useful rule, and it's applied quite often in central force problems. Notice that the eigenvalue does not depend on the magnetic quantum number. This is because the parity pi is a scalar operator, and its eigenvalues can't depend on the other. But it do, they do depend on the L. It's minus one of the L. So that's an important rule. All right. Here's a, a few more considerations about parity. Um, frequently in practice, uh, if you do any research in AMO physics, chemistry, or anything, you end up doing a lot of numerical work, uh, solid state physics as well, a lot of numerical work diagonalizing Hamiltonians because there's no theory for doing it analytically. Uh, so let me say, make some remarks about what's involved uh, in by analyzing the Hamiltonian, perhaps numerically, if the Hamiltonian commutes with parity, which it frequently does. Parity has two eigenvalues. The eigenvalues of parity, which I'm calling E here, are equal to plus and minus one. Uh, parity is a remission operator, and so this means that if E is the Hilbert space, it means that the Hilbert space can be decomposed into a direct sum of two Hilbert spaces, let me call them the odd and the even Hilbert spaces, the subspaces which are orthogonal to one another, in which parity is minus one in the odd space and plus one in the even space. These are the eigenspaces of parity. Now, uh, if we want to diagonalize a Hamiltonian, the idea is you take a Hamiltonian, you choose some convenient basis, let's call them basis vectors n and m. This gives you a matrix you call HNM, and then you just diagonalize this on a computer. However, if the Hamiltonian commutes with parity, it's going to be wise not to choose just any old basis, but to choose one which is also an eigenbasis of parity. The idea is this, is that we take the even and odd subspaces. We diagonalize parity first, and then we take the even and odd subspaces, and we choose an orthonormal basis in E odd and another orthonormal basis in E even. Let's call these bases E comma, e comma n here where E is equal to plus or minus 1, tells you which of these two spaces you're in, and then N just labels the basis vectors in the given subspace, like this. And so now what you want to do is a set of matrix that looks like this. It's E N on one side, it's H in the middle, and then it's, let's call it E prime, E prime on the left side, and then E N on the right side. This is the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian in this basis. This is, by the way, it's called a symmetry-adapted basis. This is a basis that reflects the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Well, you can easily show by the fact that the Hamiltonian is invariant in the conjugation of parity. 
this is diagonal in the D E prime times something else that depends on, on everything else. What this means is that we set up the matrix for the Hamiltonian. And we go out like this, and we break it up into the even block and the odd block, or pick odd first, odd and even, like this, odd and even. Uh, what you find is, is that because of this product or delta, you find that the off diagonal blocks are all zero. And you only get matrix elements in the Hamiltonian amongst itself connecting odd states or connecting even states. The language what we say is oftentimes say is the Hamiltonian does not connect states of opposite parity. It's a way of saying that there's zeros here. Let me show you how the impact of this has on numerics. Uh, there are many algorithms for diagonalizing matrices, uh, but a common one, which is called the householder algorithm, <coughs> goes as n cubed, where n is the size of the matrix. That's the amount of, uh, of, uh, of labor or computer time involved. But if you can block diagonalize your Hamiltonian by using a symmetry adapted basis, now you have two matrices. There's twice as many matrices as before, but they're only half as big. So the labor now is n over 2 cubed times 2 which is in, in cubed over 4. And you see, using the symmetry adapted basis cuts the work done by a factor of 4. And so this is, a, this is a simple example of the symmetry adapted basis, but it shows you some of the advantages of using it. Uh, by the way, if you're talking about ordinary rotations, the Hamiltonian commutes with rotations, there's a symmetry adapted basis for that, too. And that's what we've been calling the standard angular momentum basis, MJM. The idea here is you, you diagonalize J squared and JZ first, and then you worry about finishing the diagonalization effectively in the gamma index. Once again, you get block diagonal structure with the matrices for the Hamiltonian. And although there's now more matrices, they're also much smaller, and the total work is much, much reduced by using symmetry adaptive bases. All right. Yes. Sorry, that's just my little bit faster than I think. Does the E, is E related to the minus 1 to the L that we were talking about? Well, it would, depend, it would depend on the Hamiltonian, actually. This, this wouldn't have to be a central force Hamiltonian. It could be 1D. You could have a 1D Hamiltonian, for example. But maybe you have a potential that satisfies V of X equals V of minus X. And um, then, the, then the, the rule here is that if you're going to use a basis, because you can't otherwise diagonalize a Hamiltonian, use a basis in which the basis vectors are eigenstates of parity, the vectors of even and odd ones. I mean, if you did the harmonic oscillator eigenbasis, that would be taken care of for you automatically because the even ends are even and the odd ends are odd. So if you had a, an even potential, the harmonic oscillator basis might be a good one. You'd get this block diagonal structure if you did. So when we break up the, I guess maybe I'm confused about how to know when it's odd and even. When we break up that, like how do you know that you can break up that eigenspace? Which I can space. How do I know I can break up the Hilbert space like yeah. this? Because pi is a permission operator, and it has two eigenvalues, which are plus or minus one. Yeah. And anytime you have a permission operator, the eigenspaces are orthogonal spaces. The entire Hilbert space breaks up into the orthogonal subspace. In this case, there's only two. And if the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, which it usually is, the E odd and E even are both infinite dimensional. It's still an improvement. Okay. Now, um, the, the last thing I want to say about parity involves selection. Rules. And uh, to give you an example of this, the most important example, uh, let's talk about selection rules in uh, electric dipole transitions in a, in a hydrogen like atom. Uh, as I've explained previously, uh, the relevant matrix elements would then, this is ignoring the spin of the particles, so we just use a spinless model for the atom, and we put the position back to the middle. We talked about this matrix element earlier when we were doing, talking about rotations. Uh, this is an example in which the bigger Eckhart theorem can be applied. The operator in the middle is k equals 1, the irreducible tensor operator. And so the selection rules that come from the bigger Eckhart theorem say that this matrix element is equal to zero unless the L prime, the angular minimum on the left-hand side, is an angular minimum that's reachable by combining L with 1, as to say L cross with 1. The 1 here represents the spin of the photon. And 
combining L with 1, you of course get L minus 1 or L or else L plus 1. There's three choices like this. So, uh, as far as the figure effort right theorem is concerned, these are the restrictions on the, magnet, on the angular momentum that allows the matrix element to be non-zero. There's also one, there's also a rule, in, a selection rule in the magnetic quantum numbers, which I'm not writing down. I'm just going to focus on L. Now, however, if you had parity to the mix, if the system also commutes with parity, which it will because these are central force Hamiltonians, then there's additional selection rules that are not obtained by the bigger f right there that come from parity. And it works like this. Let's take this, use the fact that the position operator is odd in the conjugation by parity. So n prime L prime M prime, if I put a pi R pi, let me put the dagger first, pi dagger R pi and LM, Given that this operator in the middle is minus r, this has to be the same thing as minus nlm prime on the left times position vector r and nlm on the right. <coughs> so this just comes from the transformation properties of, 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 uh, of the position operator. However, we can now let the pi over here act to the right and the pi dagger act to the left. And so what we get here is minus 1 to the l plus l prime times the original matrix element. So unless minus 1 to the L plus L prime equals minus 1, this is about to vanish. So if we, so this is by linear F right there. But by parity, by parity, we see that this is equal to 0 unless it's basically, basically the rule is, is that L plus L prime uh, minus 1 is even. That's the rule. And this is actually more easily stated by saying that delta L, which is equal to L prime minus L, is even. It's another way of saying it. I can turn this plus sign into a minus sign because it's the same thing as adding 2 plus L, and that's an even number. So the result here is, is that to go back to the original selection rules, this matrix element is equal to 0 unless delta L is even. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I'm saying this wrong. Yeah. L plus L prime minus 1 is even, so delta L has to be odd because of the norm. That's the point. And so the, so the matrix element is, is a 0 unless delta L is odd. And this comes from parity. And as a result of this, the middle possibility where L equals L prime, which would be allowed by proper rotations only, is actually excluded by parity. And so the net matrix elements for dipole transitions, electric dipole transitions, on the L quantum number are that delta L must be equal to plus or minus 1. So, for example, in the case of hydrogen, where we have the 1s ground state, 2s first excited state for 2p, a 3s, 3p, 3d, like this, the transitions that are allowed is 3d to 2p, that's allowed, 3p to 2s, because this is delta L equals minus 1. If we go 3s to 2p, that's a delta s equals plus 1. 2p to 1s, those are all allowed. If this one, 2s to 1s, is not allowed by theory. This is an interesting fact because it means that if the hydrogen atom finds itself in the 2s state, it cannot decay at the ground state by the emission of a dipole, electric dipole photon. As it turns out, there are other mechanisms for that decay but they have much smaller matrix elements, and so the transition is much smaller. So even though the 2s and the 2p levels are both in n equals 2, and even though they both have the same energy, their transition rate to the ground state is radically different. It's a difference of about 10, 10 to the 8 in, uh, in decay rate. Um, so the 2p state decays in the 1s state very fast, about 10 to the minus 9 seconds. 2s to 1s takes about a uh, tenth of a second. 100 million times longer. All right. Um, this rule, by the way, that delta L has to equal plus or minus 1 is sometimes called the quartz rule. It was, um, it was discovered uh, experimentally in, in the early days of spectroscopy before the theoretical explanation became available. Uh, that explanation was supplied by Wigner. And uh, it's really just what I just showed you using the conjugation by parity here. It's a simple argument. 
Uh, Mignon later on said that this was his, uh, of all of his results, this was the one that he was most proud of, uh, explaining the Horn's rule on the basis of symmetry. All right, that's the end of time reversal, uh, excuse me, of parity. That's all I want to say about it. And now I'd like to make at least the beginning of the time reversal, uh, which will continue next time. If I said it wrong, excuse me. No, I do want to make a beginning of time reversal. I do want to make a beginning of time reversal. Made a pun on it. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm sparing you from some of my puns, too. Some of them are pretty bad. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, time reversal. So that takes care of parity, and now I want to, want to turn to another discrete symmetry, which is important, which is time reversal. Let me begin by uh, saying uh, time reversal is, is harder than, than parity. It's, it involves more formalism. Uh, let me say something about time reversal, time reversal in classical mechanics. Let's suppose we have a particle moving in three-dimensional space under some forces, and there's a trajectory that's given by the position vector as a function of time. So it's moving through space like this as a function of time. You can think of this as a movie, or we turn it on and watch the flow of it. Now, if we run the movie backwards, we get something that follows that goes to the same region of space, but it goes in the opposite direction. That's r minus d. We'll call this the time reverse motion. Let's suppose that the initial motion is the solutions of Newton's laws and some force of electric field perhaps out here. The question is, is the time reverse motion also a solution of Newton's laws? In other words, is it physically allowable? There's a mapping here that takes us from the original motion to the time reverse motion, and the question is, does it convert a physically allowable motion into another physically allowable motion? And the answer to that question depends on what the dynamics is. It depends on the nature of the forces. Suppose, for example, they're purely electric forces. So then the mass times the acceleration, suppose it's a charged particle moving in an electric field, is given by the charge times the electric field evaluated at the position of the particle, like this. Well, if we change the sign of sign on time, because the acceleration involves second derivatives on time, the left-hand side goes into itself, but the right-hand side uh, and the right-hand side is also. And so the result is, is that uh, in most of it, in an electric field, the time reverse motion actually is a physically allowed motion. It can take place. Now, on the other hand, if it's a magnetic field, then we again have the force equals mass times acceleration. So the mass times acceleration is the force, but that's the same thing now as Q over C times the velocity V, which I'll write as VR dt. Uh, crossed into the magnetic field. Now if we, uh, now if we, so let's say R of T satisfies this equation. Does R of minus T satisfy the same equation? The answer is no. The left hand side is two, the second time derivative, so it goes into itself when we take T goes to minus T. But the velocity over here changes sign because it's a first derivative. And so the left hand side is invariant, the right hand side is not, and the answer is not, the, so the, 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 uh, so the equations are not satisfied. You know, if you just think of a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field, the direction the particle you know, goes in a circle, particle motion in a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field, the direction of the motion is counterclockwise if the particle is negative, and it's clockwise if the particle is positive. So the direction of the motion depends on the sign of the charge and not on the initial conditions. So if you change the initial conditions to swap the velocity, it doesn't change that right into the left. In any case, magnetic motion of magnetic forces is not time reversible in classical mechanics. And I hear the ding of the bell, so I guess I'll stop with that and we'll carry on with time reversal.